you know, to say that uh, David has been at the National Air and Space Museum for a long time is really sort of a almost an understatement. You know, I was looking in the uh, archives the other day, and I found this photo, and uh, it shows. You can get it to share. He's trying to strike a deal with Galileo. <laughs> I tell you, it's that takes me back quite a few years. All kidding aside, uh, David is a West Coast native. He uh, got his bachelor's in astronomy and physics at UCLA, advised by Frederick Leonard, who was one of the founders of the Meteoritical Society. He got his master's at Yale. Uh, in astronomy, and then went uh, across the pond to the University of Leicester for his PhD in the history of astronomy. Uh, back stateside here, he was associate professor of astronomy at Central Connecticut State University, and uh, then went to uh, Air and Space Museum as a curator. And so he's a uh, also been on the staff at Lick Observatory, at the staff at Yerkes Observatory. Uh, he was the uh, one time the chair of the history division of the American Astronomical Society. He has written books, The Race to the Stratosphere, a definitive biography of Henry Norris Russell, A Practical Astronomy Guide. He was the editor of the American Astronomical Society's First Century. And a co-author on a fine coffee table book on the Hubble Space Telescope images. And... He was a prime mover in getting the Cook Telescope at the and an observatory installed at the National Air and Space Museum. Huh. And uh, he also, let's see, he's got an asteroid named after him, asteroid 4262 Dvorkin. And he was in the room when Pluto was voted out of the little planets table. <laughs> so uh, even in his retirement as a senior scholar, senior uh, curator at National Air and Space Museum, he's got a strong commitment to outreach. He'll even drive across straight state lines to go to a star party in a bus parking lot and hang out with people like yours truly to hobnob with the public and look at astronomical uh, uh, objects here. So uh, it's a singular honor for me to introduce to you David Dvorkin. David, you're, uh, you're muted, so you want to unmute yourself there. There we go. Hi. Thanks, Cal. That was marvelous. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, do I start? Let her rip. Okay, uh, there we go. Well, uh, hello everyone, and I'm delighted to be with you, and uh, especially to talk about um, a question that a young uh, visitor asked, not the one in the picture, but uh, uh, one of many, uh, since we give many, many tours to Google Public, and there was one fella who just looked at me and he looked at the lunar lander and he just said, how did you get that? And I've, I've remembered that question, you know, question for, for ages. And I'm thinking now uh, my next project after my biography of George Carruthers is published and everything uh, settles, uh, uh, possibly using that kind of a question uh, to frame a um, 
something of a catalog of the uh, astronomical uh, instruments that have been collected by the Smithsonian over the past 50, 60 years. So uh, uh, let us begin uh, uh, talking about collections. Our, our regents, our, uh, the highest level of uh, the Smithsonian have proclaimed for years, collections serve as an intellectual base for scholarship, discovery, exhibition, and education. And I certainly feel that is the case. Uh, it has been that way for quite some time, uh, but there is a uh, practical uh, uh, limitation. As a noted historian uh, observed in reviewing a number of museums, science museums, so museum collections show you not what there was, but was collected. And I uh, take that really quite uh, uh, seriously in terms of, well, how did things get collected? I like to think of objects as living things. And part of that is being collected. It's being- David, I, I, do, I just want to interrupt real quick. You're not sharing your screen at the moment. Oh, uh, how do I? Well, I, I've got the full screen here. Yeah, you just go back to share screen on your- uh... Nope, it's gone. The, the, I have nothing but the slide. I'm completely, let, let me hit escape. In the Zoom control, go to the share screen option. Should be at the bottom of the screen. Yep, okay, I'm there. And then choose PowerPoint. Uh, yep, that one. So you, you didn't see those uh, those things. No, that's why I was getting back yep. to you on that one. So okay. that, and yeah, hit from beginning like we did before. Yep. Okay. Slideshow from beginning. There we go. Excellent. Now, now we can see it. I see it. Okay. So, hello, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just start again. Um, this this uh, whole pro proclamation about the importance of uh, museum collections. Um, uh, is something that I've been fascinated with for the, uh, I'd say at least half my life, uh, and probably more. Uh, and I ask myself, what is the life of an object that is in my collection? Uh, it would be um, something that somebody conceived of, a tool of some sort to solve a particular question or, or create a certain capability. It would be something that was actually used in our case on a telescope. Uh, it was then possibly something that became outdated and was retired. And if it wasn't completely uh, uh, cannibalized, uh, it was uh, hopefully of sufficient interest to be collected. But the process of deciding what to collect and what not to collect is a very complex one. And simply, as you can well imagine, collecting three-dimensional objects, especially big ones like airplanes and space uh, shuttles, uh, is a very expensive process. So there are uh, very strict rules over, over what we can collect. I won't go through all of them. You probably will look at a few, but observe, for astronomy, observing deeper into the universe and with finer detail uh, is a very, very important factor in deciding to collect something. Unfortunately, as you can well imagine, these, these objects get bigger and bigger and bigger because of that fact. And so we have to be very, very discerning as to what element of that tool uh, is important. Observing something that changes our understanding of what the universe is or what objects in it are. And we can go through all of these, opening the spectrum, uh, so on and so forth. Something that uh, was predicted and confirms our uh, observations. So we go through all, all of them, but the one I like the most is anything new, weird, or interesting, uh, like something that represents an important name in astronomy, technology, or society. Um, this is the one I, I've always liked, but it is the least popular uh, by our, uh, uh, deemed by our collections committee. Uh, large uh, museums that have uh, collections with multiple curators have to be organized in some logical way. And typically there is a peer group of curators uh, who decide 
um, uh, uh, what is to be collected, what is not based upon proposals of the curators. But then that uh, uh, decision has to go up upstairs to the administrative levels, depending upon how much money is involved and that sort of thing. So it's a very complex process and sometimes it can take quite a bit of time. So where do we start? Well, we're gonna start with some, uh, in fact, we've already seen him. We start with William Herschel uh, and we start with uh, the optical visual parts of things. And in this case, um, it's borrowing William, Carolyn, and John's 20-foot reflector for an exhibit, uh, which we had uh, in, uh, in the museum for some 20 years. Uh, the um, um, object is, of course, on loan, but the, uh, the life histories of artifacts should not only be limited to the ones that we collect, but uh, th in, in, in thinking about a, um, a universal strategy that, you know, if something is preserved somewhere, it's preserved, and we certainly have a national strategy among a number of science museums uh, that, you know, I don't have to get all of the instruments from the space shuttle or all of the instruments from that are brought back from the Hubble. Uh, I would get some, and then there's others that maybe fit better where, you know, where the PI was and that sort of thing. So, but in terms of the tube, uh, it has been, as you can see, uh, up to 1958, it was stored in, uh, in the Herschel home, uh, in an attic, in, in a loft, and it was pretty much, um, uh, we have no record of anybody paying any attention to it. And that loft, of course, is in uh, Slough in, in England, which is the west of, west of London, uh, where it happens to be where the Wins, uh, uh, Windsor Castle is. And um, uh, by 1958, uh, the house was being um, uh, either transferred or dismantled, not quite sure. And so there was an auction of uh, all the things in the house. And that included uh, a 20-foot tube and mirror uh, that was auctioned and was assumed to be, um, uh, since no one was absolutely sure at the time, uh, uh, the, uh, one of Herschel's tubes telescope tubes. Uh, the 20 foot, there's no single 20 foot. There were many, many uh, uh, variations on that, but we did find out which one this is. Jake Zeitlin uh, uh, bought it. Uh, he, in fact, is a famous collector from Los Angeles. Uh, I knew him because I took guitar lessons from his son in the 1950s, and he, he donated it to the National Maritime Museum. Uh, the two in mirror were on display uh, in the 60s, but they were put in storage in the 70s, quite surprising to a number of people, I, I'm told. And in 1999, uh, it was loaned to the Air and Space Museum uh, with 10-year renewals, and it's now been um, uh, there. It's still in storage, and it will be with us, hopefully, for another 20 years. Now, the process of getting it to uh, to, to the museum was really quite complex. Um, there was a small uh, airline uh, that uh, flew packaged materials all over and they donated, they, they offered to donate um, uh, the, the uh, wherewithal to pack and ship uh, the tube and mirror uh, by plane. But the uh, National Maritime Museum said no uh, because uh, the uh, instrument has to be shipped with a curator. The curator has to accompany it at all times. So that, that curator came on a, um, a, on a, on a ship, a transport, uh, the Shugi, and we followed it, of course. We knew exactly where it was. Uh, it um, it uh, arrived in Baltimore. We were there to uh, watch it be picked up and followed it down to uh, Washington, and here it is in the truck. So that was the process. The first discovery we made is in the back of the mirror, it's William Herschel. And that I think is a symbol for Uranus. You guys can correct me. Uh, and sun. So that told us that this is probably the first mirror that uh, William and John made, which makes it about uh, 18, 19, 18, 20. So that, that dates the mirror. This is of course the back of the mirror, the front of the mirror is in a little better shape. Now the tube is the most interesting 
uh, thing to see. When we opened up the box and everything, we looked and there's a Newtonian hole, but we're still not sure if and when it was ever used as a Newtonian. As you know, it, the Herschelian uh, has only one mirror reflection to be able to see as faint as possible. But the other thing we discovered uh, was all of this junk. And uh, strangely enough, uh, we looked at it and it was, it was just stuff uh, from uh, the, um, oh, a visitor would have at the National Maritime Museum. Uh, if you notice that display of the tube at the National Maritime Museum, you could see that the tube was open and evidently people just thought it was a great place to uh, throw stuff, which is kind of sad. But that's part of the history of the instrument. We checked uh, Herschel's own uh, description of how uh, he made uh, one of his last tubes and it fits uh, this, this description of what you see, the structure of the inside of the tube. And so we're really quite sure that this is the uh, instrument of uh, the tube that uh, John Herschel and, her, and William made together in the 1820s. And uh, John eventually took to South Africa. There's also some interesting graffiti that we discovered. None of this was cataloged uh, by the museum at all. Uh, and we found this JH plus one, and we're still wondering who the plus one could be. Uh, all of the ways that this is put together agrees with the description, uh, the historical description of how the tube was put together. So that verifies the history. Now, our job, of course, we just got the tube uh, alone with the mirror, uh, was to reconstruct the, uh, uh, the, the, the mountings in, in a way that would work in the museum. And uh, I, uh, this is, uh, she's uh, Beatrice Mowry uh, was the designer who uh, helped uh, translate the, uh, the drawings and work with the uh, craftsmen here to uh, create a uh, facsimile of the mounting that uh, could fit on a wall and uh, be half solid and half art in, on the wall there. And um, we also had, wanted to reproduce uh, William Herschel. And uh, with all of this effort, eventually, uh, we uh, had, whoop, let's go, voila, the opening of the gallery. Uh, this is what people would see as they walked in, not at the entrance, but about halfway through, through to the back. And the opening of this gallery, Explore the Universe, was on September 12, 2001. Uh, it was a very, very, um, you might say, uh, quiet opening, sadly. But we did save an awful lot of money, not uh, from the money that we had collected uh, to do the opening, you know. And uh, with it, we were able to start an education program, which I thought uh, was a good end. The mirror itself uh, is is here, uh, the tube, and of course the uh, uh, figure of Herschel observing through the top. Uh, the our our artists and craftsmen went to a great deal of trouble. Uh, and, and research, even taking uh, the, uh, the date of uh, what, um, what kinds of designs uh, for the date of Herschel's work uh, would you expect on a, um, on a, on a, on a retaining uh, metal wall and uh, did a great job putting it all together. And by the way, I'm not gonna talk about it, but as you walk through here, as you walk into this dome, uh, the Newtonian cage of the uh, 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 Mount Wilson Observatory was in there. We did not uh, get the loan renewed, unfortunately, and it, but it will be displayed beautifully at Mount Wilson. Okay, well, we got big mirrors and the whole idea here, of course, is collecting more light and, you know, the bigger, the better. Uh, but the question is, how do you do it? And uh, um, what's in it? Now, I'm sure that many of you uh, did what I did. Here I am about uh, 15 years old, you know, watching a mid fifties television, um, grinding an eight inch mirror. And John Dobson, of course, uh, had made this a very, very beautiful and wonderful activity, uh, pub publicly uh, bringing it to many people. Um, but this is the old way, uh, old way, but fun. But how do you make bigger mirrors? Uh, the biggest mirror when I was working in the Griffith Observatory optical shop that was could be made there 
by hand was between 10 and 12 inches. And that was kind of tough going. Um, uh, how do you do a bigger one? Well, how to make really big ones, you use a machine. And uh, the machine that uh, we have uh, in the collection uh, was the machine that George Willis Ritchie uh, developed based upon a draper design um, uh, uh, to be able to 60 inch um, uh, platform. And he sort of, um, he wasn't the first to do this. Uh, Herschel, both Herschel and Ross and Common were uh, the ones who on their really big mirrors, they use sub diameter tools on top, but he was the first one to create it in a flexible environment where you could program the thing. Uh, and um, uh, uh, he, he built it first at Yerkes Observatory in Southern Wisconsin. And then it was moved uh, to uh, Santa Barbara Street in Pasadena as Hale moved, of course, to Mount Wilson. And eventually it built uh, the uh, 60 inch mirror that became the uh, core of the 60 inch telescope at Mount Wilson. But this is of course, just the beginning. Now, how does it work? Uh, let's take a look at a fellow, an optician. I happen to uh, uh, get a hold of this now, I had to get rid of the sound because even though he's speaking, you can't understand him because the machine is so noisy. But this was a really great, and you notice he's standing on the turning table. It's a very robust machine. Uh, by adjusting, what he's saying is by adjusting the lengths of the various arms and back, you can uh, program, mechanically program the thing to uh, uh, create any shape you want on that rotating, on a mirror on that rotating table. So this is, there's a 60 inch grinding machine, which of course, um, uh, well, once we, we got it and it's a very long story of how I uh, became aware uh, that, uh, of the existence of the machine. The machine was sold to, um, uh, by, by um, Mount Wilson. Uh, at that time it was, it ended up at Caltech in the, in the forties. Um, and it was sold to the uh, Lick Observatory uh, at the time when Lick was building uh, the 120 inch and it wanted at least two grinding machines to make all sorts of optical uh, components. And uh, the, uh, the, the video was um, uh, when it was still being operated at Lick. But now by the time I saw it and I was visiting, I, uh, as, as, as Cal mentioned, I was uh, a staff member at, at Lick Observatory uh, for, for, well, just about nine months. I was an undergraduate and took a, took a year off. Um, and uh, I got to know this machine. It was there, I was fascinated by its history. And then when it was moved uh, to Santa Cruz, uh, and then it was finally uh, 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 retired, uh, we found it in this sort of shape, a bit of rust and everything, which you can imagine. Uh, but we decided to acquire it. And um, that was a, 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 something that I really had to argue pretty strongly with, uh, with uh, curators at the Air and Space Museum. Uh, there's a big, big, big feeling, you know, of what's the difference um, in an astronomical instrument? Well, what's the difference if it's on the ground or if it's in space? And we're the Space Museum. We should just be collecting space. Well, I feel you can't appreciate what is flying in space unless you know what was being built on the ground that was limited by, by the atmosphere. And it's the precursors, of course. And so um, uh, I finally got this approved and I found a uh, shipping company that was happy to donate uh, it, it, its uh, services to ship it to, uh, to us. And in fact, when it did arrive in pieces, it just fascinated our craftsmen in our restoration facility, like um, John Eckstein over there looking at it. We, we, we put, uh, put it together, got rid of the rust first, and then put it together just to see that all the pieces were there. We found that it was missing some parts. And then uh, Lick Observatory was uh, very, uh, very uh, forthcoming in, in completing it. So it is now uh, visible. You can see it on display at our Hazi Center uh, in the space hangar. And um, I, I just wish we could um, uh, fire it up with, uh, it, has a, it has a motor system here. It's certainly not the original system. These are all things that were uh, 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 put on the, on the uh, table over the many, many years it was in operation. 
Um, but uh, I have not gotten too much interest in making it operational. Uh, uh, and I'm joking, of course, there. Uh, so the 60 inch uh, led to the 100 inch because this was the prototype machine that was a bigger one was made to build, build the 100 inch. And it, of course, the 100 inch led to the 200 inch. And so I would like to move now to a story that involves the 200 inch. Uh, now, of course, you know, we have not collected the 200 inch, but uh, we have collected important parts of it. I want to go to that. We start out with discovering the radio universe uh, from the three C catalogs uh, at Cambridge in the in the 50s. As the resolution for radio telescopes got better and better and better, they started finding um, point source radio uh, sources and wondering what the heck they were. Uh, they uh, found that, I mean, these were very faint. So the largest telescope was recruited uh, that uh, had connected to it uh, the fastest spectrograph in the world. And this is a spectrograph that was built in the late 40s, a uh, grading spectrograph uh, that uh, had an F1 camera on it. And it was extremely fast, optically fast. The um, person who used it first, uh, no, no, not first. Um, it had been used by a good number of uh, Caltech and, uh, and um, uh, visiting astronomers. Uh, but the one who did the most work on galaxies was Martin Schmidt. And by the 1960s, he had shown that uh, the optical components, the optical portions of these very, very, very energetic radio sources were a whole new class of object, what we call, of course, quasi-stellar radio sources. On one of my uh, trips back home, I, uh, I was raised in Santa Monica, California. Um, I decided I would uh, visit uh, Caltech uh, and uh, I made an appointment with Martin Schmidt, uh, hoping that he would uh, donate one of his spectrograms uh, to the collection for exhibit in a new uh, in our new exhibit. But when I found Martin, uh, he was, uh, as I say over here, uh, crunching 57 gigs of, of data, which was a lot for 1999. And uh, he, he seemed glad uh, to, to see me at that point. We talked a little bit and he said, well, uh, the, the spectrograph uh, has been retired. It's a photographic uh, instrument and has been superseded technologically. Uh, and uh, um, uh, uh, so they're no longer using it. But the person who really knows about it, the spectrograph itself, uh, was uh, his senior colleague, Jesse Greenstein, uh, a very, also a very well-known astronomer. And so here we have Jesse um, um, with the uh, uh, spectrograph. Uh, they, they did have it in the shops uh, in uh, Santa Barbara Street air, uh, in Pasadena. And uh, they brought it out, cleaned it up, and uh, it hadn't been used for quite some time. Uh, but then with it, I interviewed Jesse. In fact, uh, this was a video interview. Uh, and uh, we first asked him what it was like observing with the 200 inch in the prime focus cage. And then uh, the advice that he gave to uh, uh, astronomers who would uh, want to use uh, the device in the prime focus cage. So here is Jesse in the, okay, let's go, come on. When the telescope was built, an observer had to ride throughout the night in the prime focus cage to ensure accurate tracking of the telescope. The astronomer ascended in the cage 80 feet above the floor in a specially designed elevator. And Can you imagine event. being inside of that thing? That is crazy. Uh, well, uh, it was very coveted uh, place to be. People would uh, uh, fight like anything to get observing time on the 200 inch. Of course, the two, a 200 inch had a good number of, uh, of, of uh, uh, foci, you know, like coude and stuff like that. But this was the fastest system, the, uh, the prime focus. So if you're going deep, this is what you want to use. But now Jesse had advice for young people who wanted to get involved. You also had to have a, a tough bladder because <laughs> it's possible if it was a good night, you stayed up from seven o'clock to five, it's 10 hours. 
Yeah, uh, Jesse was uh, very helpful that way. Very popular teacher. That well, just the instruction Shannon gives about going up to the 14 inch dome. <laughs> okay, I hear you. <laughs> now, how did this machine work? Uh, because in order to, to uh, collect it and to display it, I had to uh, sort of take it apart, deconstruct it. And uh, for that, uh, I was helped with, um, uh, by some op optical ex expert friends of mine. We, did, we couldn't take it all apart, but I, I, I interviewed Jesse about the components. And basically the, the light would come in from below the mirror, uh, go through a slit, uh, uh, be, be uh, reflected to a very, very fast collimating mirror that would make the rays parallel onto a reflection grating uh, dispersed into a spectrum, uh, then focused by another extremely fast camera, F1. And in fact, they even had an F.5 camera at that time uh, into the surface now. And then where is Martin Schmidt in all of this? Well, he's there uh, observing the uh, 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 a star or starry-like object. And the technique was pretty straightforward. Here is the uh, quasar uh, the, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> uh, with an image from the 200 inch prime focus. And he would move the slit up and down the uh, uh, thing to widen the spectrum. And from that, of course, was produced uh, these kinds of spectra. Now these were very puzzling spectra. Uh, Schmidt wasn't the first one to uh, uh, produce these spectra. Greenstein and others did. And they, they labored for some time. They looked familiar, but everything was in the wrong place. And what uh, Schmidt realized when he did about 30 of these was that there was a consistency uh, to the brightness, uh, visual brightness of the quasar. And uh, if you interpret the uh, strange line patterns as, uh, as um, being shifted due to velocity, uh, there was a correlation, just like what Hubble had, and better understood by the Hubble Lemaitre law, of course. So this is how we uh, displayed it. We put the uh, instrument in a uh, crys crystal cabinet, glass cabinet. We had the context for it up in the wall behind. And then this represents the beam of light from the 200 inch mirror coming to the slit uh, and uh, where the observer would guide uh, the instrument. So this was uh, the, the project, putting it all together and uh, very happy with this. And I'm also happy that it will be on display uh, as soon as the new galleries open in a few years. Now, as long as we're talking about big mirrors, how about big mirrors in space? Here's the uh, Hubble Space Telescope mirror. You can certainly see it. I'm sure many of you have seen this fascinating one with with the opticians reflecting the optician's face. Now, it, with any large object like this, that's a critical component. It was standard practice at NASA to, um, to, to make at least two mirrors so that if something went wrong with the primary, there would be a secondary backup mirror that they could use uh, to continue uh, the, 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 manu uh, the, 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 the whole process. In this case, it would be uh, grinding and polishing uh, the primary mirror. Uh, so we all know what happened to the, the, the flight mirror. You know, it was uh, had a little problem with its figure. But it turns out that the backup mirror, which was made by Kodak, figured by Kodak, was perfect. But there it was sitting in, uh, in a Kodak uh, storage room. And uh, what to do with it? Uh, one of the ideas was to bring the Hubble back and, and substitute the mirrors. That was extremely uh, outlandish in terms of expense and, and danger and all of that. So as you know, uh, the uh, 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 flight mirror was corrected by uh, optics uh, in the uh, COSTAR, the corrective opt uh, optics uh, system, which we, by the way, collected also. So what about the backup mirror? Uh, what do you do with it? Well, NASA uh, polled uh, the astronomical community saying, does anybody want it? Uh, can you use it? And, you know, it's, it's a, a, a nice size mirror. Um, uh, but the trouble was it was made to work in space. And in a 1G environment, 
as you moved it back and forth, every single little part of it had to be uh, somehow supported. And uh, as a result, astronomers and um, craftsmen weren't too interested in it. You can see, of course, the, the cross hatching here. The backup was never aluminized. And even though there were some thoughts about aluminizing it for display, I said, absolutely not, because we want to show uh, how these light, lightweight mirrors were made that went in, go into space. Uh, they're even lighter now in proportion to their size. Uh, but here we are uh, with uh, one of the Kodak craftsmen looking at the joints uh, and wondering if any of them, uh, he had a, a polarizing uh, microscope actually that um, could tell if any of the joints uh, for the, uh, the support system there were, were uh, somehow damaged uh, in transit, but seems like everything was okay. Now, we also collected the uh, test frame that uh, held the mirror when it was moved around the shop uh, to uh, be tested uh, from the grinding area, the polishing area, then the testing area. And uh, with that, um, the Kodak people very nicely brought very interesting suction cup device that could lift the mirror uh, supposedly without distorting the surface. And I never understood that. But anyway, it was lifted. Uh, the mirror was lifted into the cradle and then the cradle was uh, brought up vertically. And this is how it was on display at the Air and Space Museum uh, for uh, just over 20 years. And it will go back on display happily in our um, space hall uh, that uh, will be next to uh, the, the uh, backup, the engineering backup model, uh, full scale of the Hubble. So it'll really be a nice con contextual um, uh, uh, story. We also collected the wide field planetary camera, uh, the faint object spectrograph. Here it is at Goddard. And then here, well, here it is being taken out of, out of, out of the payload. And here it is at Goddard being inspected. Uh, neither were to be used again. And uh, they both uh, came available through the usual complex NASA uh, transfer system. Uh, the Air and Space Museum does have an inside uh, track on uh, things that are excess property uh, from NASA, and it really, really has helped us build the collection. Uh, but it still takes a lot of, uh, of uh, negotiating because there's a lot of questions as to whether parts of it could still be scientifically useful. In the case of these, the answer was no. So countless discoveries and still counting. And uh, we are very proud to have this. We also have CoStar uh, with it. So the life of the Hubble is being preserved. Now let's come to another um, uh, preservation uh, uh, example. This is a new display uh, at the Air and Space Museum that you can go and see now. And of course it has a rover there, but here's, here's an interesting object. Now this is a camera and a spectrograph uh, that was built uh, at the Naval Research Lab in Washington. And uh, it, it came to us in a very different way. Um, NASA in the past, when, when the Air and Space Museum was first opened, uh, it would deliver uh, packages and, and, uh, of, of, of uh, instruments and objects uh, uh, that were only classed by mission. And so there was a big deposit of Apollo hardware, it was called, that uh, came to, uh, uh, to the museum back in the 70s. Uh, and it was uh, not inventoried until the early 80s. I came to the museum in 1981, uh, and uh, this whole package was still being inventoried. And this particular instrument uh, I found, I, I didn't do the work myself because it was, it was classified as Apollo. Uh, but when uh, somebody figured out what it was, it was a camera, uh, they asked me if I knew anything about it. And I said, oh, absolutely. Uh, this is uh, the camera that was used on Apollo 16, um, built by George Carruthers at the Naval Research Lab. And um, uh, I even, um, and, and was taken to the moon uh, to do, to scan <clears throat> the far ultraviolet uh, universe, but also most important, to uh, examine the exosphere, the uh, geocorona of the Earth, which was the key element that helped 
uh, monitor or helped us understand the effect of solar radiation on the Earth's upper, upper atmosphere. <clears throat> this is something that was of extreme importance to the Navy then and now. And the, the Naval Research Lab people had been uh, uh, working, sending uh, 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 sounding rockets and others up into, up into the atmosphere for years, trying to gauge uh, the structure of this uh, part of the uh, Earth's upper atmosphere, and especially to gauge uh, it, how it is influenced by a change in solar activity. Now, the original instrument, of course, is still on the moon, but the one thing that they brought back was the uh, film canister. And um, there's a fun story about how that was brought back. Uh, the, the, the camera the telescope was, was designed and built by George Carruthers. Uh, he's best known for his patented uh, uh, detectors, uh, electronographic uh, type detectors that um, uh, combined the powers of uh, 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 pho photoelectric amplification uh, in imagery and made little telescopes like, like this one behave like big telescopes, a factor of tenfold or something. Well, uh, what uh, George, I had interviewed George on a few occasions and interviewed people who uh, had been at NRL and told them that we had the uh, instrument and we'd like to uh, uh, reconstruct it, put it together. And so he brought in uh, some of his students uh, from uh, Washington, D.C. area, and they reconstructed it. And then in 19, this was in the early 90s, and then several years later, he donated uh, the film canister. And an interesting story there was that uh, uh, when this uh, instrument was first displayed, it was displayed next to the limb uh, in, the, in the, one of the main galleries. But then it, when the limb was moved to space, the space hall, uh, this, this little um, camera didn't go with it and they put it in a lovely case in the Apollo to the Moon gallery. It was a sealed case. Well, on one occasion, somebody, uh, one of the uh, 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 staff opened up the case to uh, check on the condition of the instrument. This is standard. And they smelled something really, really odd. It's, it smelled like something decaying. And so the, it, it, the, the whole procedure had to be find that element of decay. And I had the crazy idea that, my God, maybe there's film in it and it's decomposing. Well, uh, they opened it up and they found no film, but there was a very strange corrosion and rust on the side of it. And so we got that all fixed up. So this is how we better understand the lives of these, these instruments. Now, as I said, uh, the Naval Research Lab had been interested uh, or had been devoted to understanding the upper atmosphere, especially for naval communications and reconnaissance. And um, the early uh, 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 payloads that they developed for the use on Vikings, on V2s, and later on Arabies, uh, they still had plenty of them around. And so I did a bit of, of video, video history work, uh, looking at the uh, having, having the, uh, uh, the, the first generation of space scientists uh, explain and talk about the instruments that they built. Uh, this is an X-ray counter that, of course, has an opaque entrance window, but this is an ultraviolet one where you can see the anode here. These are like Geiger counters. And the key here, which helped me better understand what uh, the, the, the environment in which George Carruthers worked and made his, made his wonderful machine, was testing, testing, testing. And I, I love to show this video here of Robert Kreplin and, and E.T. Byram demonstrating uh, the practice, demonstrating it um, not consciously. I didn't ask them. Uh, I simply asked them about the tube. And this is how Kreplin looked at the tube. I know that it's only supported a yes, more that's right. So had you solved the, uh, the problem of uh, ruggedness? With you see, he's tapping it. Um, the anode's fairly thick. And that was that was a, a fun piece where you know if if any one of these these guys got a hold of anything that we were um, uh, uh, acquiring that they were donating to us uh, they would always be testing it if, if if it was in their hands and George pretty much inherited that that uh, that practice. Now let's see. Okay, 
Here's another example. Uh, this is a blown uh, uh, gas chamber from the largest X-ray telescope that was flown in the first generation of the observatories, the great observatories, uh, and it was HEO. Uh, and here is a blown chamber. And you ask, well, why, why did we collect that? What does that big crack tell us? Here's the answer. have one here that seems to have gone through some rough times and now the, the requirement from uh, of NASA was that this be tested to four times its rate of pressure mm -hmm. it's, uh, we were going to operate at 500 psi so the test had to go to 2000 they went to 2000 successfully but they didn't stop the test they ran it on up and blew it up do they want to test it to destruction? They wanted to, but if I'd been there, they wouldn't have done. Hmm. Yeah, well, that's that's one that uh, illustrates the difference uh, between the uh, our, our tradition as uh, growing up in the uh, space business, uh, running our own shows, and then uh, getting involved in the uh, very uh, large programs that NASA was running, and the the management uh, levels uh, get piled one on top of another so that now working with the shuttle, we find that uh, in a case like this, it's necessary to build four of these to get one because the first has to be tested and burst. The second one has to be tested, cycled, and then burst. Mm -hmm. The third one uh, has to be cycled. And again, this is you know two, two levels greater than flight. And the fourth one you can use. Assuming the fourth one has the characteristics of the first three. Well, that's that's assumed, I guess. How comfortable do you feel in those types of assumptions, especially when you're dealing with contractors? Well, I don't I don't like the idea personally. Yeah. You do prefer to fly one that you test. Right. Okay. Well that that gives you an idea of the of the flavor of the um uh uh, of the work experience at a place like the Naval Research Lab. But if we were to move into, let's say, the microwave and ask ourselves you know, about the early universe, uh, I find very, very much the same kind of, of, uh, of philosophy uh, with uh, uh, Robert Dickey in his creation of what was called the Dickey Horn here, which was the first, his first attempt at Princeton uh, to uh, uh, measure the microwave uh, background radiation uh, that was finally, of course, successfully done by Penzias and Wilson. Now, you can't collect the whole thing, right? Uh, and, and by the way, you might know there was a big question as to what the future of the home Dell was going to be. Uh, they were going to, you know, turn it into a parking lot or turn it into some sort of commercial establishment. Well, the local home Dell community uh, uh, literally purchased it and are creating a lovely park and preserving the Holmdale Horn. And this is just a wonderful uh, piece of news. But my, my uh, challenge was, how do we display um, elements of the story of detecting the early universe? Uh, I decided that you, know, you can't collect the horn and the detectors themselves are extremely difficult to understand. But um, this pigeon trap, is a very understandable thing. And the key to uh, convincing Penzias and Wilson that they were seeing something celestial included getting rid of the pigeons uh, that were uh, roosting in, in the horn and leaving what you might call a white dielectric substance. They cleaned it all out, they cleaned out the pigeons. And so uh, I decided this would be a, um, a, a wonderful uh, artifact to collect. Uh, R. Wilson had it, and he was happy to loan, uh, at first loan it to us, and then he gave it to us. And we put uh, this little fellow in here, the New York pigeon, uh, just, just to make the point. Uh, again, I had a little bit of problems uh, getting the museum's approval to collect it, but when I made the argument, they said, well, it isn't very big, so sure, go ahead. Now, Moving from there, move to the particle universe. One of the most interesting stories is uh, how uh, uh, what happened to Victor Hess's uh, electroscope 
that he used. I don't know if you know the history, but in 1912, Victor Hess took this electroscope in a balloon and he looked through that uh, 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 eyepiece there on the right. Uh, there were two charged wires here uh, that were inside the chamber. And what he knew was that if um, there was penetrating radiation, it would uh, discharge the charged wires and they would move from being separated uh, to being together. And what he found was that the rate of separation and the rate of, sorry, the rate of coming together varied with altitude. It got greater as you, as he moved up, you know, eight, 10, 12,000 feet. And that convinced him that the radiation, this residual radiation that people had been wondering about in the 1910, 1912 uh, uh, period uh, was celestial. It was not earth-based. And later on, of course, it was uh, uh, called, uh, they were called cosmic rays by somebody who was still skeptical, Robert Millikan. But then finding this whole thing, here's, the, here's a quote from the owner uh, of, um, uh, of, of this object that was eventually donated to Fordham University and they gave it to the Smithsonian. I found it in an old kitchen of an apartment near Fordham. It was owned by an old professor of physics, I think. At first I thought it was some sort of old coffee, teapot, maybe a pressure cooker, but there does not seem to be a way to open it up. And this stock here has a lens in it. That was it. And uh, one of our, the curators who was in charge uh, just immediately knew what it was. He, was. he was a historian of physics. And so we acquired that. This is the beginning of particle universe or particle astronomy. Now, continuing in that, uh, of course, the cosmic rays were charged particles. But uh, what about uncharged particles like neutrinos? Uh, you, I'm sure you remember uh, the supernova, 1987A. It made the news uh, before it was just, you know, an invisible object in the small Magellanic cloud, but then it suddenly brightened up in February of 1987. And it was a supernova, one of the brightest, and was, um, became the object of interest for uh, many uh, optical telescopes at the time. Uh, the, the Hubble wasn't uh, up yet, unfortunately, but the International Ultraviolet Explorer, IUE, was up and it started uh, examining the far ultraviolet uh, spectrum here, which um, uh, gave a better inter uh, 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 record of how the expanding gas interacted with uh, the local environment. But then some people started wondering, well, uh, you know, since, since we, knew, we knew the sun produced a neutrino stream before then. Uh, but what about, um, what about all these objects like supernova or anything? If they produce neutrino streams from uh, the neutron uh, uh, interactions, then um, uh, they should be observable too. And could they be observed? Well, there turned out to be a neutrino detector uh, in Japan, of course, uh, Kami Okanda. And uh, it was the detector that uh, uh, once, once the physicists there were told uh, that, you know, there was a supernova, they started looking in their data and they found the neutrino flux about 11 to 12 minutes before uh, the first light of the, of the supernova, which made sense. The neutrinos uh, uh, traveling at the speed of light essentially uh, were not um, affected by the a star. And so uh, they, 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 they preceded the photons. Well, um, it, it, you know, here was the beginning of a new astronomy. And so this is the sort of thing that definitely would, I'd want to collect. Turned out there was an International Astronomical Union meeting uh, in, uh, in Osaka. And uh, I went after contacting the, the people in uh, the uh, uh, neutrino uh, area up there in Kamioka. And so after the meeting, I took this wonderful train ride including some really, really nice food in a, in a bento box. Here's some of the food over here. And uh, up, up here, and then uh, the um, physicist picked me up there and moved me down to the actual site. And notice that this is a local uh, uh, store, a convenience store in, uh, in, in Kamioka, and they name everything Neutrino, which is quite fascinating. Anyway, 
here here is uh, the uh, some of the offices and buildings for uh, the uh, neutrino uh, 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 observatory. And one would go across here and into the mountain uh, to actually get to the detector itself. And uh, they very, very kindly uh, uh, offered to uh, take me in. Here we are uh, about to go into this uh, labyrinth here. Uh, coming, I'm not sure exactly from what direction we came, but we got about as far as this area here and never did get in here because when it's operational, nobody goes in there. And besides, there's no light in there at all because all of these photoelectric detectors uh, that would detect the uh, light from Kerenkov radiation produced by uh, uh, electrons traveling faster than the speed of light, um, you know, any kind of light would, would uh, destroy uh, the data. Uh, so we went down the tunnel. I got a little scared at one point because the tunnel was disappearing, but we finally uh, came out to the uh, central area where they have the water purifiers and everything else in here and uh, went inside and looked in various other passageways for a detector uh, that had decayed and was therefore no longer useful. They didn't throw away the detectors. Uh, they wanted to recycle them. Uh, but uh, meanwhile, the recycling didn't uh, happen very quickly. And so they were building up quite a bit of, uh, of uh, decayed detectors. And I wanted one where the cathode had decayed just enough so that you could see on the inside what the thing looked like. I mean, it's just a great big photo tube about 22 inches in diameter. And there it is uh, with Dr. Suzuki. Uh, and here's the cathode here. And here I am taking a picture of it. Uh, and that also came in for display and it's been on display. Uh, it will be on display again when the museum galleries reopen. Moving on finally to the dark universe. Um, as you know, there were hints since the 1930s that something was pulling uh, objects in ways we couldn't explain by the known amount of matter detected or known to exist in the universe. And as, as some of you may know, you know, Fritz Zwicky and, and others are, are um, remembered very, very passionately as the people who first started seeing these effects in the coma cluster and other places. Where was this hidden matter? It attracted the attention, certainly in the 1960s, of a uh, wide amount, a uh, wide number of astronomers, uh, especially um, uh, this astronomer, Vera Rubin. Uh, but it turned out that she was much more interested in, in the structure of galaxies themselves. She wasn't particularly looking for dark matter, but what fascinated her the most was how do galaxies really rotate? There was some evidence that they rotated like LP records. But everybody was convinced that they rotate like whirlpools. That's what you see. And uh, so uh, she uh, set out to um, answer that question, mainly by uh, using an instrument, this one here, that was very, very powerful. It had another form of image tube in it called the Carnegie image tube, which made the telescope, this was either the 72 inch Perkins or the 84 inch, uh, bigger than the big, you know, more powerful than the biggest telescopes in the world. So uh, with this spectrograph, uh, Vera Rubin and, and, and her, her cohort, uh, Kent Ford, uh, put together this observing program. This is the spectrograph that Kent Ford had made for a wide number of purposes at the Carnegie Institution, but the image tube is here. And, and, and it, it was an uh, image tube that was uh, put an image on a photographic plate there. I interviewed Vera, of course, Dr. Rubin, uh, but I also interviewed Kent Ford, and he had a set of these Carnegie tubes available, both in uh, for different parts of the spectrum. This is one for ultraviolet. And we had quite a wonderful uh, session on uh, how these were made and how they were made rugged and rugged enough to use. Uh, I'm not going to go through the uh, the, the interview, but I uh, just wanted to let you know that uh, these, these were all put together and this was the key to their advantage. Now, what I can't find up here, uh, go back. 
there is a there's an audio up there, but it but it's it's cut away. It's it's Vera Rubin's voice uh, talking about how uh, as she was interested in the structure of galaxies, uh, she uh, was very interested in in uh, using radio uh, studies of the structure of galaxies. But then she knew from Kent Ford that they had an optical instrument that was so powerful that they could probably do optical studies of the dynamics of the galaxies. Now, what does that mean? Well, if you look at the Andromeda galaxy, uh, you had to have a really big telescope to take very, very small areas of the galaxy and get enough light in there uh, without any scattering to be able to determine the, rotation, the rotational qualities. Is this part uh, traveling less fast than this part? Uh, over a period of uh, quite a long observing period of time, she did dozens and dozens of selective areas uh, in these areas. Some were H2 regions and others, and eventually came out with uh, this diagram. Uh, what they expected, of course, was that the velocity would be Keplerian. Uh, it would get less uh, the farther out one was from the center. What she found was that the velocity actually increased and flattened like a rigid body. And that's, that was the, uh, the, uh, the observation that convinced everybody, basically that we can no longer ignore dark matter. Now, in the past, uh, from from the 30s and on, it was called missing mass or missing matter. And you can see here the citations to Zwicky's original paper back here and here uh, in the 1930s, Zwicky and others, that it, it was noticeable, a few citations uh, over the years uh, for the dark matter. But the, it, it look first at the missing mass term. Uh, in 55, there was maybe you know 20 or 30 citations. Uh, in the 60s, there were maybe 50 or 60, but by 65, 69, when uh, at the end of 69, when Vera Rubin's work uh, came out, uh, it got into the hundreds and then uh, into the thousands by the, uh, 1970 when, when the, her observations were, were, were finally completed. Uh, if you look at the term uh, uh, dark matter, and this is basically using the astronomy uh, or the astrophysics data system, looking for the number of papers using the term dark matter uh, or using the term missing mass. Look, look at the dark matter one. Uh, the word wasn't used until the 80s. Uh, missing mass became dark matter. And that really shows that her paper uh, uh, convinced everybody. And as William Herschel famously once said, uh, he who uh, proves discovers, quote unquote, and he said he, he should have said they, but then again, that was his world. Well, we've gone through uh, a lot of these and I simply, you know, delighted to have the chance to show you a few examples of how we got that and why. And of course, uh, to memorialize, to display, to educate and to stimulate. Well, thank you very much for listening and I, I'd be only too happy to try to dodge any questions you might have. Thank you, David. That was great. That was really interesting, you know, and and some of the, my favorite times that I've had was taking a tour through those museums. Um, and if you ever had the chance, obviously, I'd love to go walk in this museum with you. But, you know, Cal is taking me through the one out at uh, Dulles. I've been to that. I've been to both museums multiple times. And there's always just something new. When when does the one on the uh, mall open up again? <laughs> It's half open now, and uh, there are two astronomy-related galleries that are open. Uh, the, the Planets Gallery, which won a, a design award recently, and it's beautifully organized by, when you walk into the gallery, you're walking into the solar system. So you start with the, like, the Oort cloud, and then you go into the outer, you know, the Kuiper belt and outer planets, and you move toward the sun at the very center. Then the other is, um, is, um, uh, the uh, old Apollo gallery, which is now called, to my, I, I just love it, Destination Moon. How many people have seen the movie Destination Moon? Yeah, I've uh, seen that. Yeah. Maybe, uh, how about a dozen times? I mean, it's my, my favorite movie of all times. I can, I, can, I can jab and chat endlessly about it. My, my granddaughter is a, uh, uh, 
specializes in, uh, in deconstructing uh, movies. And she says that one is amazing. But anyway, um, uh, uh, <laughs> I just forgot what I was talking about. Um, where was I? Destination Moon Gallery. Yeah. Destination Moon and how these are organized. Yeah. So uh, the Destination Moon, the planets, everything on the west end is, is open now. Uh, the east end, uh, which uh, includes the Space Hall, uh, the IMAX theater, and the um, uh, eventually the replacement for Explore the Universe, which is called Discovering mm -hmm. Our Universe now. Uh, they will open in a few years. And it's, it's highly, I mean, the, 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 the schedule changes all the time. The planetarium is open, though. And it's a completely new planetarium. It's completely automated. Uh, the Zeiss projector uh, is no longer there, uh, the one that was behind Cal. And I, and I also am very proud that I was able to uh, uh, fight uh, uh, the, the, the powers that be to save the darn thing. And it's on display out at Hazi. So you can see the old Zeiss Model 6. Uh, that, that was... Um, uh, a little bit of a fight, but I finally convinced uh, uh, one of the senior administrative uh, people, and then, then it went through fine. <laughs> David, we're going to stop your screen share here real quick. Uh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So you that way we can, we can see uh, and we can talk about it if you can. There we go. Okay. Uh, so I've got uh, a couple questions came in from our YouTube uh, channel. And uh, Stephen Schreier is back in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and uh, he had asked a couple questions here. Uh, the first one, how long did it take to grind the 60, the 100, and the 200-inch mirrors? How expensive were they to manufacture? And uh, he appreciates the uh, presentation. He's got another question, too, I'll ask in a minute. Okay, well, I can't, I can't with authority, answer the first ones. Uh, the 60-inch <clears throat> mirror uh, was uh, done... Uh, let's see, the, 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 um, the 60-inch uh, grinding machine uh, was um, uh, uh, brought to Yerkes, or built at Yerkes, I'm sorry. Uh, Richie first built one that could handle a 24-inch mirror uh, when he was still at home. And then he got hired by, Yerke, uh, by Hale, and um, he, brought, uh, he, he built it with Hale's help um, at Yerkes. And then it was um, in use only uh, by 1909, the telescope was completed. And that was when it was already at, at, um, uh, at, at Mount Wilson. The problem in saying how long did it take was that the mirror grinding machine had to move along with the mirror to, uh, to Santa Barbara Street in Pasadena and how far they got at different stages, I don't know, but it was at least the, a good number of years for the telescope. The 100 inch, uh, the mirror, uh, took a long time to find an acceptable one, although Richie was never satisfied with it. Uh, but um, uh, the uh, 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 acquisition of the mirror was, I believe, 1913. And of course, it was 1919, 1918 that it finally uh, 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 got first light. The 200 inch, um, was that's corning and i know that the first uh casting did not work very well uh, in fact that's because it's on exhibit at corning and you can see it um and it was at least four or five years if i recall correctly uh steven had another really i thought pretty good question here too uh does the museum have any of the camera systems with onboard film processing it was actually developed by Eastman Kodak for the Mariner Moon missions during the 60s and 70s. It does have uh, some of the machine, uh, the, the, the Mariner stuff, but the majority of our Mariner work, I'm uh, sorry to say, is uh, the, 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 the spacecraft are hollow. There's, there's no, no uh, equipment in them. Uh, when I first was hired, uh, and uh, I was looking at a lot of the satellites. I was just uh, really bummed out that, you know, you have this beautiful shiny s sphere for the SolRAD satellite and you open it up and it's empty. So we've, we've been doing a lot of catch up. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I, any, uh, I, any I, I could, Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, I could try to find out what we have for Mariner. 
uh, wh which Mariner is you most interested in? That would be the four that did the Mars uh, uh, imaging. He asked specifically about the Mariner Moon missions uh, oh, during moon. the 60s and 70s, yeah. Mariner Moon? But now you can ask here. Help. <laughs> I can't help you on that one. I'm sorry, Doc. I, I mean, you have the lunar orbiters, and those are the famous ones that helped to figure out, uh, uh, you know, what good landing sites were. And those were uh, 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 filmed, but processed on board and then scanned. Mm -hmm. And that was that was a typical way to do it. And my guess is that some of that that technology continued. Any, anything where you can't retrieve the data, you've got to be able to scan it on board. Do our panelists have any questions uh, for uh, Dr. Dvorkin, for David? I'm David, yeah. <laughs> I have a question. It's, I think it's interesting that uh, it's not well known that there was like this Kodak uh, uh, perfect backup mirror for the Hubble telescope. I mean, it, it's the first time I hear about it. Oh, really? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, well, um, the, I think the Perkin-Elmer issue of the, of the flawed mirror uh, pretty much overtook all the, all the interest in the news. Um, but yeah, we knew about the backup because um, uh, we had some friends who worked at Kodak in the in the precision optics division who said, hey, we made one too. But it was <laughs> only through those informal channels uh, that we found that out. Why is it that, you know, the uh, the Perkin-Elmer one, um, why, why would there be two different mirrors that would have different brines on them, different polishing? How did that happen? I mean, they I, I don't understand the part. Yeah, they used two different uh, testing methods. Uh, and uh, the uh, Perkin-Elmer one was a, a newer method that uh, should have worked, but uh, one, of the, um, one of the testing apparatus was misaligned. Mm -hmm. And they never, and they didn't catch it until long, long afterwards. The Kodak mirror was essentially a, a study with something that, you know, uh, evaluated with something as like a very advanced Foucault tester. You know, which you probably know. I mean, that's what I used to use when when I was a kid. Um, uh, but the Perkin Elmer did did uh, interference testing, and uh, one of the sources was misaligned. Uh, a, a a washer was uh, not there where it was supposed to be. That's <laughs> what I know. Robert Smith, uh, is second edition of Robert Smith's book on the space telescope does a very, very good job of describing that in bloody detail. There, there were, I mean, uh, I'll never forget, uh, we were, during all of this time, uh, we went up to New Haven to visit uh, some friends and uh, we were having lunch at a restaurant someplace. And one of the people who was there was at Perkin Elmer. And uh, we were talking about this whole problem. And saying, well, you know, I, I said stupidly, you know, well, you know, um, mirrors like this, you know, they're very, uh, uh, very demanding and errors can be made. And, and she just blurted out saying, but we've made plenty of them. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's the right answer. The I was, I'm glad that you didn't say, no, it's going to be a perfect mirror because. No, no, no. But, the, but, but uh, she also, I mean. Uh, the, the reconnaissance mirrors were, were longer F-ratio and uh, spherical. So it was a very different process. And by the way, saying that, I, I say I don't have a security clearance, but that's what we've deduced. <laughs> uh, anybody else? Bob, you, were, you just found your video. You wanna, you're on mute, though. Uh, if you want to unmute yourself, that'll probably get you in for a question here. Bob, what do you got? Okay. Yeah, I was wondering, did you get a secondary mirror for the Hubble? Ah, great question. Uh, the answer is no, not yet. Uh, the Goddard people have it on display. They, they have a, a backup secondary mirror. And they, they're doing a beautiful job. And they have a lovely visitor center there. And uh, so that was it. Yeah, I wanted, uh, I wanted the secondary. Uh, we were even thinking of 
mounting the primary in the in space hall, put the secondary on there and and have it focus on some something as far away as possible so people <laughs> could look through it. But that didn't go anywhere. I mean we're we're not gonna we're not gonna illuminize the primary. Yeah. Uh, unless yep. Cal unless Cal overrides us. <laughs> he could. He could. He's, he pulls a lot of weight. Um anything else, Cal? Do you wanna do you wanna have anything there? Uh are they still going to put in the uh the astrolabe and all those sorts of things too mm -hmm. back in that the gallery? No. Uh the uh the uh gallery will start um well, I think the oldest thing is going to be the uh, Tycho uh, uh, armillary sphere. And uh, that was one uh, unfortunate, uh, sad decision because uh, the space is so limited. Uh, well, let's kind of wrap stuff up. Uh, you do look like a guy that might know where the Ark of the Covenant is. That's probably stashed <laughs> in the back someplace. <laughs> well, I, I'm pretty convinced that somebody at the... At, at the uh, uh, museum, uh, or maybe the Museum of the Bible, uh, they know more than we do. <laughs> right. That well, it's been great. Yeah, Thank that you. was that was really interesting, and I, I love. I wish I could walk through that museum with you, like I've done with Cal, and you know, and it's just it would be amazing to do that. But I can't wait for it to open again and to get down there. You know, the whole thing to open, and so we can go there. But uh, two great museums in. Two great space and air museums in DC that everybody should go see. I mean, absolutely wonderful. Well, um, I I can get to the Hazi Center pretty easily. I'm a, I'm I'm a little uh, uh, I don't walk around very well, but I can certainly get to the Hazi Center and and walk around the uh, space science area. We have some. I mean, we have the Ritchie grinding machine there. We have uh, a lot of stuff. Well, that was great. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time and, uh, you know, for coming to us. And and Thank Cal, you. thanks for putting that together. Uh, really greatly appreciate it. And, and all of our panelists and all of our members that joined us all over the place. Um, it's just great to have you all tonight. And Phil, thanks. It was great to have you on the panel too tonight. Um, and for all the help and, and you know, everything that we had, uh, you know, with the website and everything that's kind of coming together with WAS as we go into our 49th year. That is shocking. 49 years of, of loss. So more great speakers coming up next month. We'll have a whole big lineup for the year. You can see them all on the new website. So we thank everybody for coming out tonight for the uh, Westport Astronomical Society online science lecture series. And we'll see you again next month. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Bye. Night, everybody. Thanks, Bye. David. We'll see you guys. Bye-bye. Night.